What's cracking, big dogs? Welcome back to the HQ. Welcome back to the channel. This is BDGE, Big Dogs Got to Eat Fantasy Football. I am Nicholas. That is Noah at FB God on Twitter. Make sure you are following him throughout the season. Stay up to date with everything 2019 fantasy football. If you are watching, this is officially two days from regular season kickoff. And we want to help you all with your current roster. Some of you all have to drop some players in order to make room for kickers and whatnot which shouldn't be in your league settings to begin with, but they are, so we're going to help you out. we got to make sure all the big dogs are eating accordingly. We're also going to help you out with some trades, what we think you should do with rosters. So thank you, everyone, that submitted their roster pictures to Noah via Twitter. We're going to be doing a similar video like this every week throughout the season, but for Patreon members. So if you are – let me plug my Ethernet cable. Am I done this? and plug it in. Uh, if you are a Patreon member, you will be able to ask us questions on the community forum, and we might feature uh, a few of your questions throughout the season. You can go join that on patreon.com slash V-D-G-E. What's cracking, Noah? It's good, to be, uh, it's good to be back in here with you. I see you're in a different HQ. You just moved into college. Yeah, the internet here is a little shoddy, so I had to buy an Ethernet cord, and it's still shoddy, so it's going to be a struggle out here. Yeah, I kind of heard you. I heard you laughing. I think at one point, and then I looked at your screen, and you weren't laughing. So I was like, <laughs> "Is there a lag? Is there someone in my fucking apartment? I don't know what's going on." But I'm excited to be back. You just moved in for the first week, so it's it's syllabus week, senior year. No, junior year, but syllabus week's like kind of fraudulent. Yeah, I'm I'm still a junior. I'm still young. I got I got upside. <laughs> you do have upside. People are looking at me in Devi fantasy football league, so. Your breakout age is young, man. You have you'd have a nice profile on player profile. I got some I got some size adjusted speed, you know. <laughs> <laughs> Definitely have the size. We'll put it that way. I don't know I don't know what your speed's looking like. Your internet speed's not good, so that might. Be <laughs> but uh, you ready to talk some fantasy? Always. Let's hit that fucking intro, baby. <laughs> So, the first lineup we have on here is a half PPR lineup. You'll see the pictures on the screen. And we're basically going to break down, you know, the weaknesses, the strengths of the lineups, where we think they can improve, maybe some sit starts and possible trade scenarios. So, looking at this lineup, you could obviously tell the strengths are the wide receivers. It looks like he went wide receiver, wide receiver, wide receiver, possibly wide receiver off the rip with D-Hop, Juju, Adam Thielen, Julian Edelman. I do like that. The one suggestion I would make for people that possibly haven't drafted yet is, you know, I'm okay with going value-based drafting and grabbing the best player on the board. However, I will probably stop doing that as soon as I fill up the max number of players you could start at a position. For instance, um, for where you took Julian Edelman, and it's possible there was no running back value left on the board. I'm assuming Edelman was your fourth round pick. There might have been a guy like Sony Michelle or a guy like Chris Carson still on the board, which I probably would have pivoted towards because you cannot start a fourth wide receiver. I see that you have to drop someone in order to get a kicker. Um, so the weak, the weak points clearly are your running backs. So Tariq Cohen, Rashad Penny, neither of them are the starters. Um, I'm not a huge fan of Trey Burton. So there definitely are some holes in this lineup, but you have enough depth and you have good players on the bench that I think we can kind of swap some things and move some things around in order to make this a – a chip team. Let's compete, Noah. How are we going to compete for the chip? Yeah. The fact that he has those four receivers and really nothing at running back makes me want to, like, try to pair maybe a Rashad Penny and Julian Edelman to the Chris Carson owner if he has, like, a second running back. Um, I know that's, like, a big package to send to somebody. Maybe you can get another piece in return. But you can probably get, like, a top 15 running back for that package. Maybe not if Julian Edelman's injury is serious because last night or, like, a week ago when you guys see this, uh, Bill Belichick decided to play his, like, starters in the fourth preseason game, and he, like, landed on his hand. Yo. <laughs> he, I love that. I love that. <laughs> he doesn't. Julian Edelman hates it. But uh, he, got, he got taken out of the game. So I wouldn't mind just pairing that because, as you said, you can't really start any of these guys. And, you know, as a bye week fill-in, I wouldn't hate John Brown depending on the matchup. Um, and the other thing is the running backs you have on your bench with Miles Sanders and Matt Breida, I actually like both of them more than your starters. And I think by the time uh, Miles Sanders works into his, like, gets a role that's going to bring you fantasy relevance. I think acquiring that RB2 from the Chris Carson owner uh, will help bridge the gap to really bring your team to like a championship status. And as for Trey Burton, he's a guy who I don't want unless I'm going to stream him. And week one, he gets a pretty tough matchup against Green Bay. They allowed the eighth least points to the, uh, to the tight end position last year. 
And they did improve. They got Adrian Amos, too. So he's another guy I'm, like, going to try to start this week or in week one. So I, I just drop him and try to stream the position, especially in a 12-team league. You should be able to have some options off the uh, waiver wire. Yeah, I'm with you on those running backs. It's just, like, Carson is the clear one here ahead of Penny. And Penny could come out and get, like, six touches, seven touches the first game. We don't really know. Tariq Cohen, the same thing. I mean, he's going to be behind um, – he's going to be behind David Montgomery from like a running back standpoint. And sure. He'll have his games where he catches passes, but you're going to get some very inconsistent production out of those running backs. Miles Sanders, we both love, um, but it might take him a little bit of time to get going. And Edelman, I kind of wish the injury didn't, I mean, obviously I, I wish the injury didn't happen the second one, but he was someone I was going to start telling people to probably sell on because there's a lot of, there's a lot of uncertainty going on with the Pats. And I know that we have this sort of recency bias because Edelman's coming off of like his career year and that big Super Bowl game. But the, the injury just reminds us that that's what he's dealt with throughout his career. He's a guy who gets injured often. Um, this, you know, wide receiver group obviously added Josh Gordon back and it looks like he will be ready to go for week one. I like Nikhil Harry still. They have Jacoby Myers. If he makes the roster, we'll see how involved he is. But I also just think they're going to go very run heavy. So if I'm you, maybe – try to flip, like he said, Julian Edelman and uh, one of your starting running backs for an upgrade. Um, maybe a guy like Chris Carson, or I mean, I guess you were trying to sell Penny to the to the handcuff guy. So maybe you can go like Tariq Cohen and Julian Edelman for Chris Carson or go with Penny and Edelman to maybe like the Sony Michelle owner or something like that. I'm okay losing the trade if it makes your team uh, a better starting lineup. So I'm cool with that. I mean, in terms of Tight end, yeah, I would look elsewhere. Trey Burton's, you know, if you're able to – this is a 12-team league, you said? Yeah, all these are going to be 12-team leagues. Okay, yeah. I I mean, I would – I don't want to say I'd look for the – on the wire just because there's not a lot of – there's probably not a lot of depth at tight end. But, I mean, if you want to shoot us over a picture of what your waiver wire looks like for tight ends, I'd probably look elsewhere because Burton's missed the entire preseason with um, a sports hernia – surgery uh once adam shaheen turned returned to the field at the end of last year he's a huge goal line red zone threat and he took a lot of touchdowns away from burton and he took snaps away from burton and and targets and stuff so uh it became it kind of became an issue towards the end of the year so i'm i am not high on trey burton whatsoever so i'd probably look elsewhere maybe throw him in for the first week and see what happens but um i don't know in terms of who i'm dropping for a kicker it's either of those last two guys on your bench name hines chris thompson i don't really see either of them making their way onto the field to a huge degree this year or being any sort of consistent um, for um, for your lineup. So if I had to lean one, I'll probably drop Naeem Hines because if we're looking at Chris Thompson in the situation, I mean, Washington might be a really terrible team and he probably has a clear path to touches just from a game script standpoint. And Naeem Hines will have like probably like eight games this year where he scores less than a single fantasy point. Yeah, and the one game when uh, Darius Geis was in for the Washington Redskins, Chris Thompson was still being mixed in heavily on third downs, and even before that, just in passing down situations. And if, like, Dwayne Haskins comes in, he's going to have a guy, like, that he needs to rely on out of the backfield. That's going to be Chris Thompson for easy dump-offs. And even in their preseason games, uh, Indianapolis showed that they kind of want to rely on Marlon Mack. I think it was the third game. They played him on 18 of uh, the 19 snaps with the starter, so – um, I think he's going to command a three-down role, which kind of bumps Naheem Hines off the field, especially if and when uh, Paris Campbell gets healthy. They're kind of redundant skill sets, so I don't really see him having much of any value this year. Yeah, I'm with you there. Um, let's move on to the second team. This is another half PPR team. <clears throat> two running backs, two wide receivers, two flexes. Now, your boy went fucking ham on the running backs. We have Dalvin Cook, we have Le'Veon Bell, we have Zeke, and – thing to point out here looks like it's a very shallow bench now you went very very risky considering when you have a shallow bench that makes a league very very difficult um or it makes you know maneuvering around and using the waiver wire difficult because you obviously have a lot less uh, opportunity to stash guys you know you need to basically be playing on a week over week basis like even if a player might be good five weeks from now you you don't have the opportunity to stash him because it's just it's just too much cost now you took two guys who are unlikely to be on the field for week one. We know Herndon's definitely going to be out for week one. We know Zeke is trending towards, you know, holding out for, we don't, we don't know. It could be one week. It could be five weeks. It could be the entire fucking season. I still, I still like, I haven't seen a realistic point of view on what Zeke is actually going to do. I don't think we've actually had any like technical 
law fucking breakdowns on it's not like the melvin gordon one where like one writer said hey he might come back week one like thanks man i appreciate yeah, it like he might it's just a hunch but like at least with melvin gordon we know that he needs to come back by week eight you know eight games or whatever to accrue it's like for zeke we don't know what the intention behind the holdout is so for all we know like zeke and jerry jones might have a plan behind the scenes that we're all like oh yeah he's going to be back week one and like ever and no one actually knows that because we don't know the technical details behind his holdout what what the goal of his holdout is in the first place so uh, looking at the team, I mean, I, I, I really like the roster. Um, I probably would have pivoted from – personally, I, I, I would have taken a wide receiver one here over one of the running backs. Um, possibly – I probably would have faded Zeke, to be honest, just because it's a short bench spot. That might be like a tiebreaker for me and going with like an elite wide receiver one. But in terms of like the roster, there's there's not a lot of holes here. Yeah, the starting roster is just filled with a bunch of studs. And the one thing I totally agree is I would definitely pass on Zeke because you look at Le'Veon Bell, and they've been talking about him maybe getting eased in. And he has an early bye, which kind of makes sense. Like, I'd, I'd expect them to maybe ease him in over the first three weeks, get him into the bye week, and then kind of work him with, like, a heavy workload that he's used to. But because of that, you're not going to have, like, a running back to actually start in that week four bye. And with Zeke Elliott holding out, you're going to have to kind of rely on Darwin Thompson and he's been the guy who I've been seeing on Twitter going like the seventh and eighth round. And I just don't think, yeah, that, there's not enough value in that. He's pretty much like what Derrick Henry was in his rookie year where people were drafting him just hoping that, uh, what was his name, DeMarco Murray, he would, like hoping that he would get hurt. And that's the same exact thing with Damon Williams right now. Uh, you're kind of hoping he gets hurt for Darwin Thompson to return value. So because of that, like you have really good wide receiver depth. I would honestly just try to maybe move Zeke for a solidified RB2 uh, or back in RB1 because – I know you have like two really good options right now in Le'Veon Bell and Delvin Cook, but you're kind of be out. You're going to be out of luck if one of those guys goes down, or in week four when that buy rolls around for Le'Veon Bell. The wide receiver group is so interesting. Like I want to know how this draft played out. How you ended up with Galladay, Boyd, Samuel, Ridley? Because almost every draft you're in right now, all those guys go from like the four ten to the five oh five. So I don't understand. Like he must have gotten a lot of players at value. Like traded around or something. I don't know. Maybe, yeah. I want more context behind this. I mean, it's a great team overall. There's a lot of upside and a lot of floor. So I think, I mean, you'll be okay. The only thing that worries me for sure is that um, it's a very short bench and you can't be, you know, the, the beginning of the season is where, like, you want to be able to use your waiver wire spots and you want to be able to use your fab money because that's when backfields and that's when wide receiver groups are very ambiguous and you don't know who's going to have what kind of role, right? It's like where a Philip Lindsay guy – will bust out in the first week and you're like, oh shit, he's playing 60% of the snaps. That's something we can expect going forward. So that's when you want to pounce on those guys. It doesn't typically happen where a guy takes over a role 10 weeks into the season, right? Those are only injury things. But, you know, in the beginning of the season is usually when you could pounce on the waiver wire and get like hidden gems. And obviously in your situation, you don't have a lot of, uh, of leverage to do that. So I like the Chris Herndon pick, um, but to be honest with Hunter Henry and a short bench, that's probably one I've, I also would have shied away from. So, you know, um, in terms of like trade trade targets for selling high, buying low, I like uh, I like the point that you made with Le'Veon Bell, kind of working him in, having the early bye week, and then letting him ramp up after that. So for people that don't have Le'Veon Bell, he's not someone I'm looking to draft, but he could be a very good buy low candidate. Um, Chris Herndon could be a sell high candidate for you, short bench, you know, know that he's coming back after that week four bye, maybe move him because you already have Hunter Henry for – a legitimate. I mean, by that time of the season, obviously the outlooks on a lot of players are going to be different, but that's something that I think you should um, keep in mind with this Jets offense. Yeah, and all these guys you have in your bench aren't guys I'd like to drop. And as you said, these guys that pop up on the waiver wire, like a Philip Lindsay, you're going to want to drop a guy to pick him up to try to give you that upside uh, and depth in your roster. And you don't really have a spot to do that right now. So I honestly wouldn't be opposed to trying to trade Chris, Chris Herndon to a team that's a little bit weaker at tight end and maybe even MVS and just getting a wide receiver and leaving maybe a bench spot open if you want to try to pick up upside because you already do have like a really solid foundation with your starters right now. And if you get a guy who maybe a starting running back gets hurt and he's available on the waiver wire, like his backup, um, you can pick up for cheap. I would just try to roll with that because right now there's not one guy on your, on your backup, on your bench uh, right now that I would try to drop if like the situation did arise that um, a good option came up on the waiver wire. Yeah. So let's move on to another really solid starting lineup. We have another half PPR league. Jameis Winston is the quarterback. He stacks him with OJ Howard at wide receiver. You just have a fucking beautiful blend of consistency there. We have Devontae Adams, Robert Woods, Tyler Boyd. At running back, we have Mixon and Damian Williams. 
Mark Ingram has the flex. And on the bench, we have crazy depth at running back. Latavius Murray, Miles Sanders, Justin Jackson, Mario Crockett, and Anthony Miller as his fourth wide receiver. Now, a few things stick out to me immediately. One, we have doubled up on Cincinnati Bengals. And uh, here's, here's the thing with stacking. I get a lot of questions about stacking. And my, my answer is always like, yes, I'm fine with it. I don't care if it's a quarterback wide receiver or if he, even if it's a running back wide receiver. My problem with your stack, obviously, is that it's on the Bengals. Like, I tend to shy away from – that will be a tiebreaker for me picking, you know, I'm not sure how your draft went. I'm assuming it went like Devontae Adams and Joe Mixon as their, your second-round pick. Like, and, and then Tyler Boyd in maybe the fifth round after Damian Williams' third round, Robert Woods' fourth round, Boyd fifth round. You got a lot of players at value. You had a, you had a very good draft. You, had, you have some good friends that, that let some good players fall <laughs> you late in your draft. Um, so with Boyd – that's probably where I would have pivoted rather than going with him. I might have looked at, I'm, I'm not sure who was available, but like a Lockett or a Calvin Ridley or even like a, an Austin Eckler or a Duke Johnson to diversify the running back situation there in like the fifth round. Um, so I don't like stacking that team. That being said, I like your lineup a lot. Um, I'm probably not going to actually make any moves here because it's just very solid and very consistent. And you only have four wide receivers. But they're really, really rock solid. Like, they're going to give you – it's not like any of them are boom or bust. It's not like any of them have injury concerns. So, with Adams, Woods, and Boyd, I don't think you need a lot of depth behind them. And I don't want to give up anything for the running backs because I like – I love the depth you have at running back. But, like, a lot of these guys I think can go either way. I mean, Mixon's in a bad offense. Damian Williams, obviously there's a lot of, you know, just – nonsense going around going on around him right between the running back by committee or he's just going to get hurt because we've never seen him hold up uh, Mark Ingram I'm not a fan of him personally so I mean that's someone I'm not too high on so the way I look at it is like you have great running back depth but there's a lot higher likelihood that something goes wrong with the running back so I like the fact that you have a lot of good depth there so when I'm looking at this the only criticism I would have throughout your draft is mixing and matching that void mixing combination. Cause when you're on the clock, you probably had other options besides void, but I'm probably sitting on what you have right now. Yeah. That's another thing that caught my eye is kind of stacking two guys on an anemic offense. But we saw last year, despite having like Jeff Driscoll come in towards the end of the season and AJ green going down and their offense just going, going to shit. Basically they both produced Tyler Boyd went over a thousand yards in just 14 games. And Joe Mixon led the AFC in rushing. And I know their offensive line is kind of terrible again, but we saw them produce last year. So I don't, if there's a team that's terrible and you're going to stack players, I think this is the one to do it on. Not that I'm trying to, but if like if the situation ar arose like it did for you, um, I don't hate it. The only thing is you have, was it six running backs that are like usable, at least for the beginning of the season with like Justin Jackson on your bench. If I had to, just to get a solid fourth wide receiver, because right now your only bench receiver is Anthony Miller. I might pair like a Justin Jackson and Mark Ingram to get, like an upside wide receiver, maybe like a Chris Godwin. I'm not sure if the, the owner would bite on that, but um, it would give you a little bit more depth at the wide receiver position. You'd still be left with Miles Sanders and Latavius Murray on your bench, who I believe can be like RB2s this season. Yeah, I mean, you could also drop Damari Crockett. I'm not sure what your waiver wire is looking like, but um, just to diversify that last spot and maybe get a, a, wider, a wide receiver, a high-end wide receiver behind like someone that's hurt right now. Like, for instance um, – you look at who's hurt right now. That's a wide receiver like Robbie Anderson, possibly Amari Cooper. So like someone, and I doubt Michael Gallup is available. But if he is, I would easily drop Crockett for him. Uh, if I don't want to say like a noon line, I feel like that's probably a stretch. But I mean, if Robbie Anderson's hurt, like look at the Jets wide receiver core because over the first four weeks of the season, Robbie Anderson might miss games. You have Chris Herndon already suspended. We have Le'Veon Bell possibly getting um, a limited workload. So like. He's someone, someone in the Jets offense, whether it's a Nunwa, whether it's um, Jameson Crowder, who I, I don't think will be available on your wire. But if he is, I would definitely drop Crockett for a Nunwa. But look at offenses where uh, a wide receiver that you weren't expecting to kind of maybe break out in the beginning of the season could possibly work his way into a bigger load. Um, so that's a suggestion that I would probably make is swap Crockett for someone else. Yeah, overall, it's just an awesome team. And I, I wouldn't make a move just to make a move if you're happy with it. I'd be fine with that just because you have so much depth at the running back position, which is such a, sh like a shallow position to begin with. So I, I might just stand pat with that team right now and just rack up the wins early on in the season. All right, let's move on to a full PPR league uh, in which he needs to drop someone on the bench for a kicker. And this is a super flex league. I'm excited. Let's fucking go. We got Ben. We got Kyle Murray. Stat we got a lot of stack action going on here. So we have three quarterbacks on the roster, Big Ben, Kyler, Jimmy G. 
you stack Christian Kirk with Kyler, and you have the entire fucking 49ers line. <laughs> you have George Kittle, Dante Pettis, Matt Breida. I really like your team, though. Overall, I think you, ha- I think you did a great job of, of solidifying, like, every position. There's no, like, weak points. There's no, like, oh, your RB2 is shitty. Oh, your wide receiver 2 is shitty. You can improve here. What I will say is, personally, after watching this preseason, um, and I'm not sure how your draft obviously fell, I'm, again, a little bit weary of stacking on bad teams, and I am starting to expect the Arizona Cardinals to be a very, very bad offense. Their offensive line is getting absolutely murdered on every play, and it's forcing Kyler to play like a rookie. He is scrambling. His first read is no longer his first read. His first read is becoming running outside of the pocket immediately, um, and that's forcing him to make bad throws. I know he's a, one of the upper echelon guys when it comes to throwing on the run, but, like, this is the NFL. These guys are fast. They're getting him out of the pocket quickly. Um, so that makes me a little bit nervous, but I think looking at the bench, I mean, between Brita, between Miles Sanders, between Fuller, that third, that flex spot that you have will be fine. Um, you'll be able to make moves there. If I'm dropping someone, uh, me personally, it's easily going to be either Dowell Henderson or Dante Pettis. Um, just be, you already have so many 49ers, and I think you own the top two weapons in Brita and Kittle. So this is an offense that I also don't expect to be great. I mean, they're going to be improved, but I don't think three guys – are going to really be able to eat in this offense. So I'll stick with the two guys that I like the most in Breed and Kittle. I'd be fine dropping Pettis, but I'm actually going to drop Darrell Henderson here if I'm dropping someone. Um, I have not been on that hype train all summer. And just the way he's looking his preseason, he's struggling in that scheme. Like he is running the ball really terribly. They're not playing Gurley. They're not playing Malcolm Brown, which tells you how they feel about both of those players. I think Darrell Henderson is pretty far behind both those guys. And they said it all summer that like his role, if he has a role even at this point, is going to be as like a pass catching back. And that's the only role that they're really going to have for him. I don't see him getting any, like many games where he sees double digit carries. Maybe he'll have, you know, six to eight carries sometimes, but I think he'll see three to four targets in normal games. And it's not like they're going to be in game script games where they're coming back from behind. I mean, this is a very good Rams offense, obviously that um, a good team that's not going to be trailing a lot. So I, I don't really see Henderson's role being that big. Um, So between Dalvin Cook and Williams and Sanders and Matt Breida, I don't see Henderson really ever getting onto the um, uh, into your lineup. Yeah, I agree with that. I would keep Pettis just because now it's coming out that like all that negative talk about him was kind of trying to hype him up, and I'm not sure I believe that. But you don't like need. It's not like a necessity to drop him at this point. And if he does end up breaking out and becoming their number one receiver, you get that stack with Jimmy Garoppolo along with the George Kittle, and you can just kind of own the entire San Francisco 49ers production. Yeah, Pettis, uh, Pettis has played like every snap of the one. So all that nonsense, the talk about him running with the twos is obviously fake news. He's going to be on the field. And that's what I'm talking about with like ambiguous receiving situations. So yeah, I would drop Darrell because I, I do want to hold on to Pettis because he's someone that could like in the beginning of the season, he could ball out for the first three games. And then all of the nonsense that happened throughout the off season is, is in the past. It's history. And then we're like, okay, Pettis is here to stay. And he's like the real receiving number one option in this offense. So um yeah, I, I, I guess I'd hold on to Pettis for that only because I think he'll be a good trade option if he does ball out early on in the year because there was so much hype. And as soon as a player like plays well that gained a little bit of hype in the summer, they become a great trade, um, a, a great sell high target. Yeah, and the guy I was looking at as a cut candidate was actually kind of Will Fuller. And I know you probably picked him a little bit higher than the other guys that Nick was talking about, like a Daryl Henderson. But he's a guy who tours ACL late in the year last year. I don't think he's at any preseason action. Like he was taken out of practice early. I wouldn't hate just like cutting him and let somebody else like try to roster him and start him and just get zeros out of him or just inconsistent production because we're not exactly sure like when he's going to be at 100%. And if he is at 100%, like how well is he going to do that now that Kiki QT is there, uh, now that Duke Johnson's catching passes out of the backfield? Um, it's probably smarter to try to trade him to somebody, but I wouldn't hate just dropping him. But yeah, I agree. I would drop Daryl Henderson just because you're probably never going to start him. And even if Todd Gurley goes down, I don't think he sees anything more than like a 45% snap share out of that backfield. Yeah, I mean, I don't think you could drop Will Fuller. I mean, I mean, the Houston Chronicle believes that Will Fuller back in June had made a full recovery from his ACL tear. Three, three months after surgery, he was at 100%. <laughs> I, I tend to believe all the beat reporters out there when they, uh, when they talk about ACL injuries. But when I look at this Houston offense, it's like Kiki QT is probably going to start slowly if he even is in the lineup for week one. I think he's, they said he's doubtful for week one, which means that he's easily week to week. He could maybe not return to week three. And I hate the fact that he is coming off a late ACL tear. And I don't know, like the fact that we haven't seen him on the field running in the NFL, like that screams re-injury to me. I think like something bad is going to happen to Fuller probably sooner rather than later. 
but I think you're going to get some big – I think he's going to push himself, like, really hard really early, and I think you'll get some big games. And he could be a possible trade – trade candidate as well so I want to see what he does early on in the year just because they're so void of weapons right now in that lineup and I think they're going to force the ball to Fuller he has some big games he still is a re-injury risk trade his ass after a few weeks because people are going to get really high and be like oh he's back oh he's the number two for the Texans or whatever blah 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 and then it's rinse repeat him getting hurt again so I'm gonna hold on to Fuller like I'm gonna hold on to Pettis I think one of those guys over the first month of the season will become really good um, sell high candidates yeah, and if they do break out, it's not like Daryl Henderson's going to break out early in the season. If you drop him, he'll probably still be available for you on the waiver wire if you end up having like a roster spot where you can exactly. end up rostering him. So, yeah, I, I agree with that. I would drop Daryl Henderson in this situation, but the rest of your team is really solid. All right, let's move on to another full PPR league. We have one quarterback, so we're starting Jameis Winston. I love the running backs here. So we stack Kamara, Carryon Johnson, Sonny Michelle obviously takes a little bit of a hit in PPR. The wide receiver situation – is a little bit suspect between Diggs, Hilton, D.D. Westbrook, Kirk. Obviously, people are going to have different feelings on these players. Um, you know, my problem with this is that you don't have like a clear – you don't have a clear wide receiver one. Um, and I'm, I'm like hesitant to even label Diggs. Like I'm drafting Diggs as a high-end wide receiver too, but I don't know if he's really going to – like I, I, I've been kind of fading Diggs in all of my drafts so far this year because I look at – like, how much better can he do this year than he did last year, right? And, I mean, he had a good year by all accounts, and it's not like he lost you your fucking fantasy league or anything, but he was inconsistent, and he put up, what, like 1,000, 1,100 yards or something like that and eight touchdowns. In, a, in an offense that's probably going to be more run heavy, even if they stay the same, I, I expect a little bit of the pass volume to go down. I don't see him being able to top the, the stats that he put up last year. So it's like – you're going to keep drafting him in the third round where you drafted him last year, where he like barely returned value. So I would take someone else at that spot. Um, it just makes me a little bit nervous for your lineup. Like obviously if, I don't know if you drafted this team while uh, Andrew Luck was still on the team with the Colts, that would be fucking fire. But Hilton obviously has to give you a little bit of pause for concern playing with Brissett. I mean, we've seen him produce with Brissett, but like at the end of the day, he's obviously not a wide receiver one if Andrew Luck is not in the lineup. So I, um, the wide receiver situation might be something I'm trying to uh, improve a little bit. Even, honestly, I like Michelle a lot. Um, I'm really picking up steam on him, and I think I'm probably going to be targeting him in, in the late fourth, early fifth of a lot of my leagues. So I'm actually going to hold on to him even in full PPR leagues. This is going to probably sound crazy. Actually, I'm not even going to say it. I'm going to get your thoughts first. <laughs> we we got to hear. No, but I, I agree with you. You picked, like, Diggs, Hilton, and Christian Kirk are all guys that are probably going to be inconsistent throughout the year. Last year, Diggs finished outside the top 30 receivers seven times. And just with his injury history and, like, how many games he's missed throughout his career, and the fact that it looks like Adam Thielen is still their number one receiver despite everybody wanting Diggs to be their guy, um, I just think that there's way too much inconsistency. Like, they're obviously really good players, but week to week, I would rather pair a guy with Diggs, like um, maybe like a Robert Woods instead of a T.Y. Hilton, just because, sure, he did almost hit 1,000 yards with Jacoby Brissett, but most of it came out of like two big games where it combined for like over 300 yards, and the rest of the games were like around 50 yards. So I wouldn't – I don't love that wide receiver combination. Um, as for the running backs, it's really solid. As you said, even Sony Michel, I know we caught like seven balls last year, but they're reportedly getting him work out of the backfield. And even at Georgia, a team that doesn't – throw the ball all that much he topped 20 receptions during his time there in the season so um I don't doubt that he can catch the ball and as for D.D. Westbrook in a full PPR league he kind of reminds me of like a Sterling Shepard somebody who's going to catch like 65 to 70 uh balls this year and just give you a good good enough floor which I don't hate as like out of the flex position yeah fuck D.D. Westbrook though to be honest <laughs> I'm, I'm, yeah, all out, I'm all out on that Jaguars offense yeah, him and Kirk are kind of like upside plays that a lot of people like this year, but you can't forget that they're on bad offenses that probably aren't going to be in a lot of scoring situations this year. So um, they definitely don't have the upside in my eyes that a lot of people think that they do. Yeah, I mean, they get a, a much bigger boost, obviously being in PPR because touchdowns take a little bit of a hit in terms of like, you know, how they impact your fantasy team and your scores and stuff. Um, so I don't hate either of those players in a full PPR league, but um, overall, I, I mean, I like the starting lineup and – I wish I kind of wish we actually got the, the size of the league so we would know like relative to other it's people. 12 all of them are 12 all of them are 12 okay. yeah yeah I mean when you're in a 12 team league or anything bigger you obviously have to sacrifice certain spots um I don't know did, did you touch on Ronald Jones I don't want to touch on Ronald Jones I was gonna say why the fuck is he on this team <laughs> okay first of all, yeah, 
drop, <clears throat> drop Ronald Jones if there's anyone <clears throat> available on your wire. Um, because one, he's not going to have a pass catching role. He, he is like the third in the pecking order, if not fourth in terms of pass catching role for running backs. And he's also not, he's like fourth in the, in the pecking order for just about every like thing that a running back can do on an NFL team, running the ball. Um, he's dealing with some kind of inflamed knee. So it's Peyton Barber's the starter. Dare Agamulali is <laughs> the third down back. I think you got I it. I might have got that right. <laughs> I got that right, I think. It's going to be the third down back to open up the season, which leaves Ronald Jones with like seven carries from the 40-yard line. So uh, Ronald Jones is like the, the hype on Ronald Jones. Thank God it finally died down, but it, it really never should have been there. I'm, o- I'm okay dropping Ronald Jones since it's a one-quarterback league. If there's someone else worthy of being on the wire – I'm okay dropping. I see Josh Allen all the way at the bottom. Don't act like we don't see him. He's right under that little home screen button. Uh, yeah, I see that. I see that you like low key cut that off, hoping that I probably <laughs> wouldn't see that, so I couldn't acknowledge the god over there. <laughs> yeah, I see what you're up to. Always fun. Um, otherwise, any other any other moves? No, just in a full PPR league, I probably would have passed on Royce Freeman just because he's not going to get like any pass down work this year, and he's going to be in a split backfield anyways. I probably would have just targeted. I mean, Tariq Cohen probably would have went earlier than him in a full PPR league, but somebody like that, that can at least give you a good enough floor week to week, whereas Royce Freeman, you're kind of hoping that two other running backs on that roster kind of go down with an injury for him to return value. Yeah. Um, honestly, this next lineup, I, I, I'm, I don't even want to talk about. It. It's ridiculous. How do you have Kamara, Chubb, Evans, Diggs, Michelle, with Boyd, Montgomery? Like, how many fucking picks within the first 30 picks did this guy have? He's like Scott. He just trades all his picks and moves into like the fourth and fifth round and stacks those Bro, guys. I got to show you. I'm going to send you a picture of what Scott's I'm, – I'm playing Scott. We're in a dynasty league together. We're in two dynasty leagues together. He came in. He adopted a team um, in one of the dynasty leagues I started last year. And he had like Saquon Barkley as the mainframe of the team and David Johnson and a couple other pieces. He came in and shipped fucking everybody out <laughs> in his starting lineup right now I'm actually I'm playing him in week one and the projected points is like 135 to I think maybe 47 <laughs> there's a guy in our league like that too he shipped out he shipped out Matt Ryan T.Y. Hilton uh Julio Jones and like Latavius Murray for like two first round picks or something I was gonna say those aren't bad like trade trade away guys in dynasty but for the fucking hall that you just said is, is yeah. ugly so okay yeah so in his starting lineup in week one he has <laughs> Kyler Murray is his quarterback. I'm okay with that. Let's let's break down Scott's team because this guy's team that we're talking about before is way too good. We'll just skip that. Okay, facts. This is this is the <laughs> dynasty league. This is a dynasty roster for everybody. Starting quarterback Kyler Murray. His two starting running backs Darius Geis and Rashad Penny. His wide receivers Christian Kirk, Miles Boykin. His tight end Herb Smith. His flexes. <laughs> his flexes. <laughs> Damian Willis. <laughs> And Darrell Henderson of the Rams. And he has like he has like seven quarterbacks rostered. This is not even a super flex dynasty. He has Keenum, Brissett, Josh Rosen, Lamar Jackson, Will Greer, uh, Stidham from the from the Patriots. His best uh running backs on his bench behind Penny and Geis, it's Jeremy McNichols, Dar Dare, <laughs> Mike Boone, Houston <laughs> on the Chargers. G. Howell on the Texans, who I don't even That's know. Buddy Howell. <laughs> yeah, it's, yeah, dude. Like, <laughs> those are the those are his running backs on his bench. So if like Rashad Penny gets hurt, Howell G. Howell Jr. is the one that's coming in and playing against me in Week One. So when you said Damian, and you started with a W. I'm like, oh, he's got Damian Williams. You go Damian Willis. I'm like, who the hell is that? <laughs> Supposedly the X receiver in the Bengals offense while AJ Green is hurt. But I will say, I mean, he shifted off so that he can have all these picks. Um, he has like six first round picks next year and like five second round picks, but like, but like, what the fuck? That, yeah. That's like 12 straight L's this year. And I don't hate it if you're rebuilding, but I don't, I that's feel not like how you rebuild though. You can't yeah. tell all, like you, have re- Barkley, you fucking rebuild around him. You don't ship him out. Yeah. When you want to rebuild, you don't like blow everything up. Like at that point, you got to rebuild for like the next five years. And then you're competing like 10 years out. Like yeah. that's no fun. Yeah, and by that point, that league will be fucking dismantled, probably. Yeah, you know, yeah. right, I, I, right. I didn't mean that, Scott. You, you keep your rebuild. You're, you keep your rebuild. Your ten year <laughs> rebuild coming. Yeah, when, wow. when Will Greer finally gets like a starting job, the league's just gonna end. So like all that time you've been waiting is just, it's not like a waste. I guess it's fun in some aspects, but Scott, maybe in our league and maybe in our dynasty league, you'll have like a better shot at it. Yeah, uh, <laughs> Scott, you're gonna have to look elsewhere for your money. <laughs> let's let's talk about another full PPR league. 
we have Patrick Mahomes at the helm, which means you took him in the third round. The rest of your lineup came out okay, but you obviously sacrificed in some spots to take Mahomes there. And listen, everyone loves Mahomes. We know he's going to put up numbers, but this is why you don't take a quarterback early because you're stuck with one DJ Moore as your wide receiver two. You're stuck with Robbie Anderson, who has calf strain, which I'm sure you drafted him prior to that. But you have Rashad Penny and Robbie Anderson in your starting lineup which, I mean, neither of them are bad players, but, like, there's a very high likelihood that they don't really return any value to you, right? As you get lower into the drafts, obviously the players that you pick are more risky, and I don't mean that from an injury standpoint, which some of them are, but just overall there's a reason they're not picked earlier because, one, their offenses are worse or they don't have a big role or whatever the case may be. There's risk involved, and when you sacrifice those early-round picks for a quarterback, that's what happens. So if you had faded Mahomes, you could have had – uh, I don't know, like Keenan Allen as your wide receiver one and then Brandon Cooks as your wide receiver two, things would look a lot better. You're starting, I mean, I love your running backs, obviously, between Nick Chubb and Joe Mixon. But when you do the quarterbacks early, you really, really sacrifice other parts of your team. Yeah, and now Robbie Anderson's dealing with that calf injury. And the fact that he took Mahomes kind of in, like made an inability for you to add that depth. So now if a player gets hurt like Robbie did, you're kind of, you're left with nothing really on the bench. Like, sure, you have Mark Valdez-Scantling, but he's probably going to be a boom-bust guy and He's in a good offense, but look at week one. He's at Chicago, and that's not a guy I'm going to try to play. Um, you also have Rashad Penny, who's the clear backup. And deep down on your bench, you have Jerron Brown and Deion Kane, two guys who I don't think are going to have any value at all this year. So I agree with you. I would have just passed on Mahomes and tried to get more value. And in a one QB league, Mahomes has a ton of value. So you might even be able to move him, get like a decent enough quarterback, and bolster your roster and add a little bit more depth and maybe even like a starting player uh, to put in your flex, which I wouldn't hate at this point just because – if you, if you suffer another injury at, like, the tight end position or wide receiver, you don't have any depth, really, to replace it at this point. Yeah, there's definitely some moves to be made. I will say, shout out to drafting Cleveland's defense because they low-key have a great week one matchup against Tennessee. They're at home. They're favored. Low over-under total. Uh, the Titans' offensive line will be without Taylor Luan for the first four weeks of the season. And we know Cleveland's defense, obviously, their strength is the defensive line. So I'd imagine that they're going to get a ton of pressure on Marcus Mariota. And I think Cleveland low-key is one of the best streaming defenses for week one. So if you are struggling to find a streaming defense, one, the tips I always give out, there are like three or four criteria I look for. Um, and you can go to ESPN.com and just go to like the NFL scores page. And for each matchup, they'll show you the over-under and they'll show you the biggest line spread for this. Look for a team, one, that's favored to win their fucking game. So you want a team that's going to win their game, or at least favored. You want a team that's in a uh, that's at home. And you want a team with a low over-under. So the scoring for the game is supposed to be low, which obviously will take less away from your defensive fantasy scoring. And then for, like, tiebreakers, just, just take a good defense, one that you know will pressure the quarterback. So we look for teams that are going to win, teams that are playing at home, and teams in which the games are not going to be a shootouts. But, again, if the over-under is, like, 52 or something and it's, like, the Chiefs and they're favored by 14, I'm fine with that because they're, you know, projected to score most of the points in the game. So when you're streaming, stick to that formula and you'll end up with a top five defense at the end of the year, I promise you. Yeah, I, I completely agree with all those points. All right. And well, no, go ahead. Last, the last roster, we'll just move into this one. It's a full PPR league. And the first impression I get is this guy might have thought he was drafting in a dynasty league. Because his entire bench is just rookies. And it is, in fact, oh. not a dynasty league. Oh, Lord. I didn't even see the bench. I was looking at the starting lineup, and I was like, I don't hate the starting lineup at all. And then I looked at the bench, and I'm like, what the fuck are we doing here, guys? Yeah, we got DK Metcalf, who has, like, no knee. Uh, we have Paris Campbell, who he played last preseason game, but I'm not sure if he's going to be a big part of this offense in his rookie year. Jacoby Myers, who got a lot of hype, but he's kind of going down the pecking order. I mean, even Damaris Thomas caught two touchdowns yesterday or a week ago when you guys see this. So um, I'm not sure he's going to have a big role in an offense that probably wants to run the ball a lot. And his role is kind of what Julian Edelman's role is. Um, even Kyler Murray, another guy who we aren't sure how good that offense is going to be. And you're kind of putting a lot of stock into drafting him when you already had Dak Prescott. I would have just rather added a depth piece to your roster um, of a positional player instead of grabbing another quarterback that kind of has the same ceiling, a ceiling and floor combo as a Dak Prescott. But Overall, your starting lineup is extremely solid. Um, I'm not sure about rostering a second tight end like Mark Andrews, who in my eyes is kind of like a streaming guy. Like I'd rather just stream than try to spend capital on him because it's going to be an offense that's going to throw the ball like 400 times this year, and he might be lucky to see like 50 targets. So that's yeah. not somebody I'm targeting this year. In, uh, the last five guys on your bench will be on the waiver wire before week two starts. 
that's the way I'll put it. DK Metcalf is not going to play in week one. Mark Andrews is seeing like a 30% snap split in the preseason behind Nick Boyle and Hayden Hurst. The Browns defense, I understand what you did. Like you took them for week one because Jag the Jaguars play against KC, but just you shouldn't draft two defenses. That's the problem there. You should have just drafted Cleveland and then streamed the rest of them, even if you had to give up the Jacksonville defense, which like it's whatever because they're probably – it'll be all right, but they're not going to be like a league-winning pick. So I would have just drafted Cleveland and then figured out shit afterwards. Paris Campbell looked fine in his return, but like he's he has his work cut out for him to have a role in this offense, and that will take a month probably to happen, which means he'll be on the waiver wire before then. Jacoby Myers, we'll see if he even fucking makes a team, to be honest with you. So those guys are going to be on the waiver wire before we do. So don't get caught up in rookie hype when you're drafting. Um, a lot of these guys, let someone else draft them because they're going to start off very slow and then, again, end up on the waiver wire. So you'll have your choice of whether or not you want to pick them up rather than using draft picks. So I would hit the wire. I would get some more veteran guys. I would get some more guys who you know are, one, going to play in week one, so at least their value is there if something does happen. Like, at least give them a chance to – get a bigger role in their offense, right? Like with DK Metcalf, if he doesn't play, like is his value going to go up from week one to week two? No, obviously. So it's like grab guys that are going to be in the lineup. Like at this point, I would take Jerron Brown over DK Metcalf. And I think Jerron Brown would almost certainly be available on your waiver wire. Um, as for the second tight end, yeah. I'm not rostering two tight ends unless, um, like I had a draft this weekend where I got Vance McDonald in the 10th as my, my starting tight end. And then Austin Hooper was available in the 12th. So I paired them up because both guys are like, McDonald's a, a ceiling play, Hooper's a floor play, plus in the 12th round, I'm fine with that. But with Hunter Henry, I mean, you have a, you have a solid every week starter, um, especially in full PPR. He'll be getting, you know, seven to eight targets a game, and he'll be able to put you up eight to ten points on, on a weekly basis. So I don't think you need Mark Andrews back there. You don't really need, like, an upside play that you need to break out because you have a really solid starter there. So drop your fucking entire team, hit the waiver <laughs> wire, go on a shopping spree. That would be my suggestion to you. Yeah, I agree. And if this is a league where you need to – uh roster two quarterbacks two tight ends two defenses or something like that then there's definitely gonna be availabilities for or guys you can pick up off the waiver wire especially because you're rostering guys like dk metcalf and paris campbell and jacoby myers who a lot of teams probably don't have any interest in so there's gonna be value on the waivers for you maybe a guy like tyrell williams somehow landed there you can pick him up as an upside play to put in your flex spot to pair with sterling shepherd but overall it's a really good starting lineup um just problems on the bench but hopefully you won't have to dig into your bench too uh, too soon this season yeah, um, let's move to some trade questions. So, our boy Luke Emerson asks, full PPR, Ingram for TY or Ingram for Alshon? Already have Kelsey and able to pick up Herndon once I move Ingram. Worth it before the season or wait a week or two in the season to hopefully increase Ingram's value and pair him with another wide receiver for a better wide receiver two or one? Take it away, Noah. I personally wouldn't do this deal. One, especially not for Alshon Jeffrey, a guy who can't stay healthy and is very inconsistent. And we've seen J.J. Sega whiteside kind of break out so far this preseason. So I'm not sure he's going to have that solidified number one receiver role. And he's not even going to lead this team in targets behind Zach Ertz. So um, I wouldn't do it for him. As for T.Y. Hilton, we still expect him to be the number one guy in Indianapolis. But he was another guy who was inconsistent the last time he played with Jacoby Brissett. Whereas you have a guy like Evan Ingram, who's going to be a top five tight end this year in a full PPR league. The positional advantage you have of rostering uh, Evan Ingram over a T.Y. Hilton is huge. And I just wouldn't trade him just to trade him because you have Kelsey. He's going to be a guy who, after week one, after playing Dallas, a team who he has torn up thus far in his career. Last year, he combined for, was it, 148 yards, two touchdowns, and 12 receptions. In week one, his value is going to skyrocket because people are going to realize he's going to be the number one receiver on this team that either Eli Manning or Daniel Jones is going to rely on. And in a full, full PPR league, he's going to be somebody that um, another player in your league is going to want to roster. And he's in, somebody's going to give you something a lot more than T.Y. Hilton. Yeah, you're um, probably wait. a more known commodity. You're going to wait on Ingram, and then you're going to trade him. Because what's going to happen is all the guys that waited on tight end are going to realize right after week one, fuck, I shouldn't have drafted and started Mark Andrews. Fuck, I shouldn't have used a roster spot on Chris Herndon because I'm struggling at the tight end position fuck, I shouldn't have drafted Trey Burton and started him. You're going to have five guys in your league that are all in that situation, and you're going to have Ingram, and you're going to have a lot of leverage in the trade situation. So it's not only based around your team and what value you can get out of it. Look at the landscape of the position in general. So the fact that you've got two of them, I don't recommend you know, using two top five picks, like your first round or second round on Kelsey, and then taking Ingram where he's normally getting drafted in the fifth round. But I'm assuming that Ingram fell to you at value, looking at the rest – or actually, we don't know the rest of the team – but. Looking at, um, you know, where he's going, I'm going to assume that he fell to you in like the sixth or seventh round, and that's why you took him. 
in that case, I'm okay because a lot of guys are banking on a lot of tight end upside that's not going to come to fruition, and they're going to realize that very early on in the season, and that's when they get desperate. So I would hold off. Um, if you had a more intriguing name there, maybe a guy that I have a little bit higher ranked in the wide receivers, I would pull the trigger, um, but I'm not necessarily – I, I kind of want to see, like, Hilton, um, I don't have a lot of conviction on what I see him doing with Brissett. He's not someone that I'm tar- – I'm not like, oh, now his value is going to, you know, drop so far that he's going to be such a good target or vice versa where I'm like, ah, I'm all out on him because he's playing with Brissett. Um, so I, Hil- uh, Hilton's a guy I'm, I'm okay waiting on and seeing what he does before I even want to make a move involving him. So what I would do, definitely wait on Ingram um, because a lot of people are going to realize that they fucked up at the tight end position and then you have the leverage in trades. Yeah, having like a top 25 receiver compared to having a top 10 or top five tight end, it gives you so much more value to have that elite tight end because as you said, a lot of people are going to be scrambling for one. And the fact that you have two gives you all the leverage and you can get somebody that you probably wouldn't even expect would fall on your lap. Maybe even like a Robert Woods in a full PPR league who could flirt with like top 12 numbers. Yeah, exactly. If it was Woods there, I would make that trade, no doubt. Um, so we have the next question for from Jared Montini. Which flyer running back do you like most in half PPR? Mario Crockett, Justice Hill, Devin Singletary, Ito Smith. Uh, I think this depends on your lineup at the moment, like how deep your league is or if you're going to need to use one of these guys in your flex spot in the beginning of the year. I would say the one that actually has value, who's probably going to get touches to start the year, is going to be Ito Smith. Um, but if we have time to roster guys and let things kind of play, play themselves out, I would go with Justice Hill. Um, now, he has clearly run as the RB4 here in Baltimore between Ingram, Dixon, Gus Edwards, and then Justice Hill. But by the time you're watching this, all the cuts will have been made and they'll be down to their 53-man roster. We're filming this Friday, and I believe most of the cuts are going to happen after this video into tomorrow. I think they have to have them down to 53 by Saturday. And Kenneth Dixon played in the Ravens' fourth preseason game last night. So it looks like he will be on the chopping block, which I actually think is good news for Justice Hill because it was between Gus Edwards and Kenneth Dixon, right? And if you look at their skill sets, who is most opposite of – Justice Hill, it's definitely Gus Edwards. So the fact that he's staying on the field, those two, their skill sets don't intertwine. Kenneth Dixon's a guy who's athletic. He's a, he can catch passes. So if anything, he would be competing with Justice Hill still if he was on the roster. I'm going to assume that they cut Kenneth Dixon. Justice Hill moves into the RB3 role. And I think that he you know, takes a, a pass-catching role in this offense. It might be further down the line in the season, which is why, again, it depends on what exactly you need. But the fact that you called him a flyer running back means that you probably don't need production out of them right away. So Justice Hill would be my pick. I know Singletary will be a popular pick, but I I, I still think that's very much a, a committee there between Shady and Gore and Singletary. And at the ceiling, Singletary starts seeing like 12 touches in an offense that I don't even really think is going to be very good. Yeah, the fact that it's a flyer pick, I kind of threw Ito Smith out of here just because we saw last year when Devonta Freeman was down and Tevin Coleman wasn't really all that good. Ito Smith still wasn't relevant, so I wouldn't I wouldn't bother rostering him. Uh, Demario Crockett's a guy that a lot of people like, but more so in like dynasty where he can like kind of build up um, a rapport with that offense and try to get a bigger role. But not, this year, I'm not a big fan. I agree. It's between Hill and Singletary. And I actually like Singletary a bit more just because last year we saw what the Ravens did uh, down the stretch with Lamar Jackson. They kind of had just like that big jackhammer running back, just like shooting up the gut. And that's what, like, that's the antithesis kind of of what Justice Hill is. You want him out in space. You want him catching passes. I'm just not sure that they're going to use that type of running back in this offense. Whereas with Devin Singletary, he kind of gives like a similar skill set to LaShawn McCoy. And the fact that both their starting running backs ahead of Singletary at this moment are like over 31 years old. Um, if one of them goes down, I could see him working into a role in an offense that's probably going to pound the rock a lot. And he could work and see like 12 to 15 touches a game, maybe over the second half of the season, um, which I wouldn't hate out of a flyer pick. Correct, Noah. <laughs> that's the right answer. <laughs> Thank you. I don't know. I don't know what you just said to be honest, but I know. I know. Do I. <laughs> Facts. All right, we got a couple more on here. God, we have like seven more. Let's let's pick two more right here. All right, let's go with Rusty Shackelford. I like his uh his picture. Yeah. So, wow. Fucking goat picture. Goat name. Take it bas- away. Yeah, he's basically asking. Well, give me compliments at the beginning, but I'm humble, so I'm gonna leave those out. So he said, "I'm thin at running back," and this guy offered me David Montgomery and Duke Johnson for Josh Jacobs and Darwin Thompson. My mind says, "Smash the accept." Am I right? I say you are right because David Montgomery and Josh Jacobs are basically equals for me, and Duke Johnson blows Darwin Thompson out of the water. I don't see a reason why this guy offered it other than maybe him having Damian Williams on his roster, but. I'm not going to pass up the opportunity to get two, like, top 24 running backs 
for like maybe a top like 15, 16 running back and a pure handcuff. Bro, fuck that. I would take David Montgomery and Duke Johnson straight up over Josh Jacobs. If I was drafting today, Jacobs would be my RB3 there. So oh, really? you're winning on all – in my opinion, you're winning on all levels of that trade. So smash that accept button yesterday. Yeah, there's there should be no debate in your mind. And I like that mullet, by the way. So keep rocking it. Yeah, that's fucking beautiful. All right, you want to go to – we'll go with the last one because it's super flex league and spice things up a bit. Right. So this guy, I don't know what side of the deal he's on, but it's six City of Champions. He says Galladay, Brady, and Robbie Anderson for Chris Carson and Andy Dalton. And his only other wide or quarterback at the time is Russell Wilson. So for me personally, I'm going to take the Brady side just because it's a super flex league, and I think he gives you – a much better floor and ceiling than Andy Dalton, who we mentioned before the Bengals are like a completely anemic offense. And even with Robbie Anderson down, I would just take Galladay and Brady over Chris Carson and Andy Dalton any day of the week, um, especially in a half PPR league where Galladay is probably going to finish the year with almost as many points as Chris Carson. Yeah. I mean, I think Carson has, I think Carson has upside that Galladay doesn't have. Like Carson could easily finish as like a top eight running back this year. If he gets the workload that a lot of people think, but just the fact that, you're playing a super flex. You only have two quarterbacks and downgrading from Brady to Dalton could be fucking really, really, that could be like a, a league losing move for you. Cause if like Dalton just, what, what if, if Dalton, if they start off like one and seven and Dalton's playing miserable, they could throw Ryan Finley in there. Or if Dalton gets hurt, cause we've seen him, he was banged up last year. Like you could, that team can go downhill really quickly with, without like a real quarterback too there. So I'm not making the move strictly off of, um, off of Brady. I think you could probably get more, from someone else to be honest if you're gonna swap for like if you're looking for a running back or something I, th- I think you could probably look elsewhere but I'm definitely going to deny that trade yeah you're kind of you're kind of moving down way too much in quarterback for me to even consider getting a guy like Chris Carson like even if it was a Joe Mixon I'd, I'd probably do it but I'd be pretty hesitant not only because you're going to stack two bangles just in that hypothetical situation but because quarterbacks are so they're so valuable in these type of leagues and the fact that you only have one other guy um, you're going to be left high and dry if you have to start Andy Dalton when Russell Wilson's on a bye and he's your only quarterback when you're facing a guy who has two quarterbacks in his roster. Yeah, the problem with it is like – and having to throw in Robbie Anderson on top of that. I know he's injured, but like that, you know, even just Carson and Dalton straight up or Gall- Galladay and Brady, I probably wouldn't do. I don't – like I said, the upside for Carson is obviously much higher than Galladay, but in terms of like where you're drafting them and like the tier of where their trade value is, it's not really that far apart. So to drop off from Brady to Dalton just doesn't make sense. Yeah, I completely agree with that. All right. Uh, That is our first trade target video, swapping your rosters. I hope y'all found that informational. If you did, make sure you hit that thumbs up button. Subscribe to the channel if you're new. Follow both of us on Twitter. And make sure you join us on Patreon, patreon.com slash BDGE, where we will be very active on the forums. We'll be answering most of your questions throughout the week. We will be featuring some of your trade questions on our weekly episodes, which will premiere every Wednesday throughout the season. We're out of here. Noah, go enjoy Silla this week. Stay safe. Don't drink too much. I need I'll your try. I need your brain throughout the season. All right. If it's working by next week, you guys will have a video out on Wednesday. Oh, next week's video is going to be better. Huh? You're going to be <laughs> I hope not. All right. Yeah. Peace. Peace.